In our top story this morning, Shreveport police needed your help. In an update, Shreveport police continue to investigate an overnight shooting. Breaking overnight, a man killed. And a 13 Action News update tonight on the shooting death of a local teen. Shreveport police have arrested a man in connection with a shooting. We have an update now. The man believed to be responsible for the killing of a man. We begin tonight with breaking news. The murder suspect wanted Terrence Wynn. I am Terrence Wynn, and this is my story. I was just released from prison after doing 30 years and seven months doing a documentary because I was a 16 year old kid that went to prison and I had a life sentence. And that life sentence meant that I wasn't supposed to be here today. I was supposed to die in prison. So I didn't die in prison. So it's by Allah's will that I'm here. Hello, my name is George Lewis. I'm a math teacher at Green Oaks High. I teach algebra and geometry. Yeah, I've been knowing Terrence ever since sixth grade. He's doing a great job. You know, he got out of jail and hit the street running. You know, he doing positive things. And this community, this neighborhood needs that. You know, where Terrence come from and what he's doing now to give back to the community, I give him a thumbs up. Telling my story could help the youth because I was a youth that did everything wrong. I was a gang member. I sold drugs. I, defi I defied the odds. I didn't really listen to my parents the way I should have. I didn't listen to the, the community elders that had my best interests at heart. And I was an honor roll student and I took the wrong turns. So if a kid could listen to me, they won't make those wrong turns because I came from the streets. I actually, I actually did the bad things that they that they hold sacred. I'm Lady Dunbar Miles. I'm Terrence's Aunt Splash mother. Well, when he got in trouble, it worried her so bad. She got sick with the care to the hospital and they ran tests and it was a hard plus she was diagnosed with colon cancer. So she had to have surgery and she just from one day to the next, it was horrible. It affected the family really bad because Terrence was a good child and just got the, running with the wrong gang. And it affected us, it affected the whole family, plus neighbors. It just affected him knowing that he would be gone for life. And it affected him because he knew his mother was sick and there was nothing he could do. It got so bad that she was not able to visit with him. It affected his mind because he was so young and he played football and basketball at school and won trophies. We'd go to visit him, he'd just drop his head and cry, wouldn't say nothing because he was hurt. And then finally one visit he said that he was sorry for what had happened. And he didn't mean to hurt the family, but he was sorry. So we knew then that he was at that place. He's a lovable, caring young man. He's worried about the youth here in Sweetport. He don't want, he would like to go out and talk to them and he don't want them to make the mistake that he made. And he stresses it. Mind your parents, listen to your parents so things will go good. And he tells them to pray, keep God first. I love that about him. All right, please introduce yourself, state your name and DOC number for the record. Terrence Wynn, 296659. All right, Terrence, my name's Brennan Kelsey. I also have Mr. Tony Marabella and Keith Jones on the board. We'll be serving as your board. Uh, explain the process to you. We'll read some information to the record, have a parole interview, ask you some questions. You can respond at the end. You can make a statement and we'll take a vote. Uh, and then at the appropriate time, we'll allow the victims and guests to, to, to make their statements. Do you understand the process? Yes, sir. Okay, and, and we'll, we'll uh, block it out to about 10 minutes on both sides. Uh, and we'll, we'll try to stay that whoever's gonna be speaking. Uh, thank y'all for being here. Terrence Wynn, DOC number 2629-6659. You are a first class offender. 
uh, second degree murder, attempted second degree murder, uh, sentenced on 8 9 2016, three cents. Originally, 3 5 1991, life in prison, 25 years hard labor. Parole date 8 1 2017, not eligible for good time, life full term. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. All right, would you please answer Mr. Marabella's questions, please? Mr. Wynn, good morning. My name, uh, good, good morning still. Uh, my name is Tony Marabella. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions today, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, you were 16 when you first went to prison, is that correct? Yes, sir. How long have you been in jail now? 30 years. 30 years? Yes, sir. It's my understanding in reviewing your report that within the first six months of your being in prison, you got your GED. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's very impressive. Uh, I understand that. Uh, tell me a little bit about your drug use back then. Um, <clears throat> How old were you when you first started using drugs? I think <clears throat> I like probably about 12 or 13. What kind of drugs were you first using? Um, marijuana and alcohol. Okay. Did you progress from there? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, on the night of, on the night that uh, I committed the crime, I, um, I used cocaine for the first time. Okay. The, the programs that you've taken for substance abuse, tell me some things that you've learned. Tell me some things that are going to help you if you get paroled, get back on the outside, and temptations come up about drug use. What sort of things have you learned that will facilitate you in not using drugs anymore? Well, I've learned that um, to depend on my support. I've learned to to talk things over with God. And I've learned to just take my time and to take myself out of negative negative situations and negative negative environments so that I don't succumb to no type of temptations like that. Yeah. Support, you said rely on your support. That's a quick word. But what do you consider to be your support system? Oh, my family. My family. Yeah. Do you, uh, have you gone to AA or NA meetings? Yes, yes I have. Do you think those are important? Yes, very, very important. Because those that's also, something you think that you would continue to do once you got out of prison? Yes, sir. My name is Roy Hughes. I'm a former incarcerated inmate. I did 22 years in the Louisiana State Penitentiary of Angola. And um, during that time, I had a chance to uh, rehabilitate myself, educate myself to, to the highest extent that I could. Uh, I went and got two trades. I got one in culinary arts and one in carpentry. Carpentry trade I'm formerly right now uh, doing. I'm a, I have a carpentry business called FNR, FNR Venture. It teaches you how to uh, remodel houses, do floors, roofing, sheetrock, you know, whatever, whatnot. But this is a trade that, that you can live and fish with for the rest of your life. It's like an old quote they said one time, once you teach a man how to fish, he'll always learn how to fish. He'll always eat. So that's, that's the true saying in life. Once you teach a man a trade, he'll always learn that trade. He'll always be able to eat off that trade. I met Terrence a long time ago. Me and Terrence Wynn became friends uh, roughly around about 88, 89, somewhere up in them years right there. Terrence from the Cooper Road, and I'm from Moortown. We met each other because I used to I used to go up on the Cooper Road. I knew a lot of people on the Cooper Road, you know. So once we did that, you know, Sam came to know each other. I, shortly after that, Terrence caught his charge. And the interesting thing about that is, me and Terrence was together at the same place the night of the crime. But to uh, make a long story short, I met Terrence in a. Uh, again in Angola for the second time. Town was a young man. Town come to prison as a young man. Town did over 30 years in jail. Town is a, a, a visionary. Town changed his life tremendously. Town's come from being a bad character in prison to being a sought out the leader in prison. And that's a big change when you go through that, you know what I'm saying? So I admire him, the work that he do, you know, he, he started young, he matured, 
He educated himself. He started an empire, which as y'all know is uh, for the struggle and uh, his books and you know his shirts and his designs and his backpacks and his nonprofit organization that he's working with the community, trying to stop the nonviolence, dealing with the kids, getting them backpacks and getting back to the kids with school supplies. All this here that he creating to get together in the communities to stop the violence, putting the dudes together, the function, the kids, all these events that he putting together, they are starting to make a change here in Shreveport, which we need. And I and I and I, I attribute a lot of that that I think came from Terrence being in prison, how he educated himself in prison. Read books, wrote books, you know what I'm saying? Went to class, studied class, taught class, you know what I mean? That's just the road that you take in prison. You know, you, you learn and then you start teaching. All right, Mr. Wynn, would you like to make a statement and then council will uh, wrap up at the end? Is that the way we're going to do this? That'll be good. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I pray that I have sufficiently demonstrated maturity and, uh, and rehabilitation. I asked the board, please show me mercy. I would like to also thank the board for giving me this opportunity. I would like to thank Warren Vinoy for classification. I would like to thank my family for the support over these years. And I would like to thank my ex my new extended family, the parole project. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Wiseman, you'd like to wrap it up? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Aaron Wiseman. I'm a recent LSU law graduate. Um, I'm here under the supervision of Professor Lancaster, and he's been assisting me throughout the whole process. Um, so I try to think about what I should come here to say today, but all I can say is that I'm coming here to advocate for a good man. Um, when I first met Terrence, I could feel the humility and honesty, just saw it in his eyes. He told me all about what happened um, and, how, and how, how about drugs and alcohol changed his life and Made him, made him into something who he's not. Um, so that night on Christmas night was a bottom for Terrence. Uh, throughout his 30 years in Angola as a juvenile lifer, um, he's projected a trajectory of growth and rehabilitation. And that is exactly what the Supreme Court uh, was getting at in Miller and Montgomery for juvenile lifers to be rehabilitated. Um, the evidence of his rehabilitation is in his, cap his capability uh, to be redeemed. He didn't just uh, screw around when he got to prison. He got his GED uh, right within six months. Um, he confronted the teenager Terrence who committed this terrible crime uh, through victim's awareness and anger management. Um, he has committed himself to sobriety because he has seen directly what it can do to him. And he's done living in balance uh, he also forgot to say that he's done uh, celebrating recovery and he did that in 2019. Um, he's also found a, a spiritual growth uh, process that he's discovered through Islam and also through his uh, recovery programs. And he also has done the Ten Commandments uh, study program and the Experience in God program. Uh, and one thing Terrence told me, he's, take, he's been able to channel his uh, energy and passion that he's developed in the process of growth. And he's he's written several several books. Um, and one of them is about five black basketball players who all chose to go to Morgan State in Baltimore to bring attention to the, to the HBCUs. Um, and then as far as the last write-up, uh, since then, Terrence has done uh, victims awareness and also celebrating recovery. Uh, he's worked as a as um, the nurse's aide, which has enabled him to uh, help others, which has really helped him, uh, that, like the warden said. Um, and as far as the reentry plan, he'll have all of the resources of the parole project. Um, he can stay there long term if necessary. Um, and he's also done Drama Club and Malachi Dads. And uh, Terrence isn't perfect as seen by his, his phone write up, but I can honestly say that I'm here today to advocate for a good man and that he is, the core question should be, is he rehabilitated? Is he gonna, is he gonna reoffend in the same way that he did 30 years ago? I think the evidence says that he will not. Um, 
And so I humbly ask the board to uh, grant Terrence approval today. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, is the uh, panel prepared to vote? Yep. Uh, Mr. Yes. Bell. <clears throat> Mr. Wynn, I have uh, reviewed your uh, report. I've reviewed all of the records. Uh, your interview today, the presentation of your lawyers, uh, both uh, Mr. Kelsey and Mr. Jones's concerns about your write-ups uh, or legitimate concerns. Uh, your explanation is one that uh, I accept. Uh, I certainly understand uh, the position of Mr. Woods on the loss of his brother, all of the work that he did so very hard to get his brother out of harm's way and all of a sudden his brother ends up getting killed. So for that, Mr. Woods, I certainly understand your sympathy and I certainly do offer my condolences to you. Uh, we are here today to determine whether or not uh, Mr. Wynn has successfully proven himself to earn a parole today. Uh, when I look at the programs that he's taken, the drug treatment that he's taken, the tools that he has been able to put together to be able to function on the outside, his work in prison, the things that he has done in prison, the compassion that he's shown to the sick people in prison, the reentry plan that he has uh, with the parole project. Uh, based upon that whole body of work, his low risk assessment, uh, it would be my vote to grant his parole today with the following conditions. Uh, that he enroll in and work with the Louisiana Parole Project, uh, that he report to his pro parole officer weekly for the first 90 days, that he obtain a substance abuse evaluation and follow whatever treatment I assume the parole project would, would uh, assist in that. I also want him to attend three AA meetings per week for at least the first six months. Uh, I want, uh, I would, uh, require a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, with the following exceptions, that being uh, work, uh, church uh, going, or any other conditions of his supervision. And I would want him to do four hours of community service work per month and primarily aimed at young youthful offenders to be able to tell his story and how he has come through this. That would be my vote. All right, Mr. Jones. Um, I, I was I was impressed by the fact that the first thing that Mr. Wynn offered us to talk about his um, maturity and rehabilitation is his work as a nurse's aide. And uh, and the first thing Warden Vinoy talked about about Mr. Wynn's maturity and rehabilitation was his work as a nurse's aide. And, uh, and it was apparent to me when Mr. Wynn talked about it, that uh, his heart's there uh, and that, it, that it's affected him. And, it, and it's, um, it's nice to see um, a violent criminal like you, Mr. Wynn, uh, whose life has been changed by helping people who can't help themselves. And, uh, and I admire that work. Uh, I agree with Mr. Maribel and my vote is also to grant your parole. Um, my choice would be that not to put a six month limitation on the AA meetings. All right. Uh, I want you to make AA a part of your life. Can't get in trouble there. Only takes an hour. You meet a lot of people there. You'll make friends there. Best of all, you get to work the 12 steps and uh, and use that as a as a pattern as a guidebook to live a good honest life. Good luck, Mr. Thank you. All right, Mr. Williams. Uh, you have uh, two votes for granted parole today. Uh, taking everything into consideration, uh, again, difficult case. This is a, a tough case for us. Uh, you know, condolences to the victim, victim's families, uh, tragic case. And, and again, my concern, I, I, I do have some concerns, but taking everything into consideration, everything that I read, all the ward's comments, uh, I too am gonna to vote to grant your parole today. Uh, 
do your low Lorna score, your low Tiger score, uh, the work that you've done, the positive uh, warden comments, um, the things that you've done. Uh, the stipulations as stated would be NAAA. Um, you want three times a week? Is that what you said, uh, Mr. Yeah. Jones? Three times a week. You uh, maintain employment. You would go to the parole project. Um, and I, I would, uh, if it's okay with you, Mr. Marabella, I would like to see him do eight hours a month of community service. Work. Certainly, sure. Uh, and uh, follow uh, all uh, all requirements as you're uh, required to. So three votes to grant your parole. Your parole's been granted. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank good luck you. to you, Mr. Wynn. Good luck. Thank you. Mr. Wiseman, good seeing you. On Sunday, December 27, 2020, local community advocate Terrence Wynn and other members of the Priorities, Intentions, and Practical Exchanges organization, or PIPE, hosted a march slash rally on the steps of the Government Plaza building in downtown Shreveport. Ministers, parents, children, other community advocates, and Shreveport Police Chief Ben Raymond challenged men in Shreveport to recognize that youth can be influenced to avoid violent acts as a result of positive and meaningful interactions with them. Decades in Angola prison, a Shreveport man has put his violent past behind him and he now wants the community to do the same. As he showed KTBS 3's Jamie Ostroff and photojournalist Josh Hale, he's owning his story in hopes of making Shreveport a safer place to live. All a product of the choices we make. For the past 30 years, Terrence Wynn has been focused on making the best choices he can. I know God lives through me. For a lot of things I do, it don't, it don't be by my own doing, it be, it be through God, because I'm a praying man. But we wouldn't be having this conversation in his Aunt Letty's living room if not for the bad decisions he made on one December night in 1989. I said, you need to stay home, you shouldn't go. The 16-year-old T. Wynn, as he likes to be called, went to that party anyway. Several fights broke out. When I went outside, me and, me and the guy got into it. And for me and him get into it, when I shot him and other people went to shoot. So a guy, an innocent guy that had nothing to do with the incident, he came up dead. At 17, T. Wynn was convicted of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. It was, it was hard for my mom. So at that moment, it made me, it made me tougher. It made me say, I got to fight. But instead of fighting with violence, T. Wynn transformed his battle plan. Going into prison and just learning, educating myself. Through the education, my eyes opened to, to all the wrongs. My eyes opened to what I could do to right those wrongs. My eyes opened to what I can do to make changes so the next kid won't have to go through what I went through. Though it was another battle in the U.S. Supreme Court that allowed T. Wynn to put those changes to action. In 2012, the high court ruled that imposing a life sentence without parole on a child under 18 was unconstitutional. Four years later, the justices decided that 2012 ruling was retroactive. And uh, I made parole June the 18th of this year, and I made it home July the 1st of this year. What was that like, getting out? It was a, it, it was a, a surreal feeling. It was, you know, having my family there at the gate. At that point, the 46-year-old knew there was no time to waste. I came up with Pipes. Pipes is an organization which stands. It's, it's an acronym that stands for Priorities, Intentions, and Practical Exchanges. Pipes is geared to educate the inner city youth about the perils of doing, making, making bad decisions. Pete. It's a lesson he's taking back. When I got arrested over here, it ain't look nearly this good. To the place where his story began. I came from, from the Cook Road, where people really don't look for us to succeed. You went to school today? I go Monday. Oh, I go virtual. Would y'all go virtual school? T. Wynn wants to be the mentor he wishes he had. You in the fourth grade? You go to Pine Grove? I'm thinking people looking at me differently because of peer pressure. 
But when I got somebody that went through it, I'm going to listen to him. And he's bringing some new friends along with him. Good, man. How you been? I'm good. I'm we can't good. go about it saying, man, we don't need no police. We need them. They are needed. So my, my thing is I can bridge the gap with it because I can show that need. Then you can call the police because we are your friends, right? The response has been real, real positive because they understand that I actually have been through a real, real hard experience. That must mean a lot to you. Yes, that means everything to me. While we can't change the consequences of our choices. A guy lost his life that night. I, I have to take responsibility because I, I, fired a, I fired a weapon. We can change the way those choices affect our story. I took the wrong path. So I, I made those changes and those adjustments in prison to be a better person, a better person if I was to ever walk free again. And here I am. A story that T. Wynn put in a book called In No Sense. It's my plea to kids to man, stop and think before you do what you're doing. Though he knows the choice to include forgiveness in any future chapters is up to the victim's family. You know, I can't ask you for forgiveness, but the only thing I can ask y'all to do is just look at the things that I'm doing and a lot of the positives that I'm, that I'm doing and that I'm accomplishing is because of what happened that night. Jamie Ostroff, KTBS 3 News. Terrence Wynn's book is available to buy on Amazon. Hi, my name is Curtis Ray Davis II. I'm the author of Slave State, Evidence of Apartheid in America. I spent 25 years, nine days, and 11 months trapped in slavery inside of Angola Penitentiary. And I wanted to share today about my brother Terrence Wynn. I've been traveling um, by coastal from Los Angeles to Shreveport, Louisiana since the um, early 1970s. My mother was a part of the um, historic African-American migration that took people out of um, the southern area and they fled to um, Los Angeles Western um, to uh, escape um, racial discrimination in Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, the, the pressure of the police over um, oppressing us in um, Caddo Parish, which was known as Bloody Caddo, because they had more lynchings per capita than anywhere in the United States in this area um, of Louisiana. And um, I, I started um, interacting, being affiliated with gangs while I was in LA. And then I would come back to um, Shreveport for the summertime to stay with my biological father. And we started, you know, just, you know, getting into the streets, starting to understand the different areas in Shreveport and how it was broken down into so many tribe, um, tribalistic sects or whatever, your Queensboro, your, your Cooper Road, your Allendale, your Lakeside, your, you know, um, the bottom. And they had these, you know, everybody wanted to be tough type of situations. So by the time I graduated high school and got out of the military, we got involved in real serious um, cocaine distribution. And I, I met Terrence, he was about 15 years old on the um, Cooper Road. And we were always looking for more and more young guys to try to help move our machine. And Terrence was like a big, grown-ass man as a kid. So I didn't really understand how young he was at the time because he was taller than me and he had a military-type presence, right? So he was like, man, what's up, OG? You know, let, I, you know, let us roll with y'all or whatever. I'm like, man, you know, you, you sure you about this life or whatever? And, you know, he, he, he really took to the streets in a way that he wanted to try to show himself, approve, um, you know, in the African American culture, we don't have manhood rites of passage. You know what I'm saying? In, in Africa, or in, even in the Jewish community, when you turn 13 years old, you're gonna get a bar mitzvah. They're gonna say, take you in the back of the synagogue and say, this is how you become a man, all right? In Africa, you're gonna get your circumcision, you're gonna go out into the wild and you're gonna bring back the, the coat of a uh, lion or whatever it took for you to do that. But in the United States of America, African-American men ha have no connection to the source of our manhood. So we still have to find it though, because we testosterone driven, right? So we in the streets and we used to like make them get up and fight each other. You know what I'm saying? Young dudes, like, let me, let me see what y'all about. Terrence was scratch. You know, and I started liking that. I was like, man, I like this little dude. I started respecting him, even though he like six years younger than me. Like, man, I, I, I love this little guy. 
and we started moving through and Terrence started moving up in in the ranks of the young people that were around him on the Cooper Road at that time and he started getting more and more access to things you know access to the life and as he got more and more access to the life he got more and more access to the OGs me my homeboy Anthony Bolt um, key to you know the real the real OGs Terrence is a um, is a well-raised young man. I only found out after his incarceration that Terrence actually comes from an upper middle class African-American family and who have always provided for him. He has one of the best educations that young black men are gonna receive. Terrence was torn between the, the trend of being a tough guy or the capitulation which he might have thought in his mind of going straight which all of the weak dudes do in his mind once he came to prison i watched terrence develop and like some dudes say that the prison can be one of two things it could be a womb where things grow and nourish and develop or it can be a tomb where things rot decay and die Terrence used his time inside of the womb of prison and developed himself through stages upon stages. And, and it's remarkable to see what the pressure, the concretized pressure made of this young man that is now in my eyesight a diamond. He comes out here into this world. He goes to places where the preacher's scared to go. He talks to the children that even the mamas don't want to talk to no more. You understand? Because a lot of ways we're scared of our children. Terrence not scared of our children and he sees himself when he sees these young people that are running around with their heads cut off the way that they are. And I just love that he's trying to um, put their heads on right. Um, I'm a paralegal. Um, I worked inside of the um, prison library in, in Angola and I've always been involved in actually working on guys' cases. I've been involved in Terrence's case from the beginning of the situation. Terrence had a unique um, case because of the zeitgeist, the political um, times, the era, the what was going on. They had right around the same time that he caught his case, a 16 year old white guy um, got into it with some black people at what was called a hot biscuit um, restaurant at the time. I don't know the exact year, but it was the same time that Terrence caught his case. And he Went, called his dad, went home, got a shotgun, came back into the restaurant and murdered a guy and ended up getting five years probation. Terrence, 16 years old, same situation, a child, right? At a, um, a party for children his age. Hundreds of people are out here. Um, people are fighting, all kind of stuff is going on. In a very chaotic situation, Terrence got caught up with a gun and shot somebody. I don't think malice or forethought, I don't think specific intent or any of those things had the, anything in play because we're talking about 16 year olds that are drinking, partying, high off testosterone, weed or whatever. So he gets a life sentence though. And in the state of Louisiana, life mean death by incarceration, that you stay in prison until you die, right? So that they knew they was giving this baby a death penalty. And that was under the Paul uh, Carmouche District Attorney's Office. And that was one of the most um, racially prejudiced law enforcement regimes that we've had in modern time, right? So Terrence was like a test case to see if we could send these babies away forever. Because not only, it's, it's a design that's not only just directed for Terrence, but anybody like him. It was um, a play on marginalizing our people. You understand what I'm saying? So as Terrence started fighting, Terrence was a political symbol for a lot of people, but unknown to so many others where it really counted at. People in Shreveport should have knew about Terrence's case even back then. While we were in prison, um, I spent a whole lot of my time reading books, smoking a whole lot of weed, playing chess, and, and doing you know just philosophy. Terrence, on the other hand, spent a lot of time journaling and writing novels. I couldn't even get him to smoke weed. 
I used to, you know, be like, look, man, you need to ease your mind, get, get, you know, get yourself together. But he wouldn't do that. He was trying to stay focused. He was trying to really stay like, man, I'm going to be an example for these dudes, bro. And he had a clothing line in prison that guys in the prison were buying from him, right? I'm talking about no barcodes, no um, financial trade system, no distribution system. In the prison, he was using his street educated label to keep these guys understanding that even criminals need to be educated. Right, so he was developing the best of the best even then. Yeah, I saw it, I didn't have to tell me nothing. I see him now though, having gone through what he went through and able to still stand erect strong out here as a man and a warrior in black skin as something remarkable. A Shreveport man is on a mission to end the cycle of young people going to prison. He tells Fox 33's Jenna Jordan his personal experience puts him in a position to make an impact. Mothers are crying, but kids are crying too. Kids in them streets are crying, and nobody's listening to them. That's what they need. They need somebody to listen to them. Terrence Wynn grew up on the streets of Shreveport. It's easy to be overlooked, and then you only look there when you commit a crime. Something Wynn knows well. One fight at age 16, changing his course forever. The guy that I had the confrontation with, you know, he uh, he survived, but an innocent guy got killed. And, uh, you know, I live with it. I, it's hard, but, you know, I have to live with it. He served a 30-year sentence for murder and attempted murder and was just released from prison in July. It was just a situation where this, this guy shouldn't have lost his life. I shouldn't have took that, I shouldn't have took that man's life, but, you know, that happened. And it wasn't intended to happen, but it happened. Facing his past head on by trying to change others' futures. I can understand how they think. Even though I, my thoughts are reformed and uh, I'm, I'm walking this great path, I come from this. Using his life story as a way to relate to those growing up in similar situations. Some people want popularity, but most people want love. Founding a group called Pipes to reverse the flow from streets to prison, calling on all to lay down the guns. The only way you don't, no one loses is we stop. I'm Shaterika Nashe Isaac and I am 34 years old. I am the owner and operator of Play to Learn Child Care and Enrichment Center. I've been in business for going on 11 years this year. During the time that we would visit, I remember Terrence would come out, he would be chained down, um, there would be other inmates and they would have to wait until their name was called. But when he came out, he was like super happy. Um, he would always bring us things, make us belts, cards, um, rocking chairs, things like that to give to us. I was probably about the age of maybe like 17 and 18 talking to my grandmother and we were talking about the incident and what happened. Um, I think we were looking through some of the court, maybe records or something, um, the transcripts. And from there, we decided to go and move forth and talk to an attorney. He knows what he, what he wants to do. He knows what he wants to accomplish. Um, he has his goals that he would always talk about, you know, his books and things like that. And he wants to see change in the community. He wants for our youth to have someone to look up to, and that would be him. What's up, it's your girl, Princess Kai, and I am the first female rapper for Street Educated. I'm a 16-year-old rapper from Louisiana, and rapping makes me feel more like me and it helps me express myself. Meeting Terrence has helped me express myself through music because he has helped me go to shows, go to studio timing, and um, do videos. Hey, uh, Street Educated was formed while Terrence was incarcerated. He did 30 years in like seven months. And when he came home, he hit the streets running and he basically came home and educated the streets. Be on the lookout for the new clothing line through Street Educated. We got five music, female rappers, the best in the city. We got good books coming out, so go check that out for the struggle.
Hey, how everybody doing, man? This is uh, Terrence Wynn, AKA T Wynn. Man, we in the Peace Street Projects. <laughs> man, this is the place where my life took a change. This is actually the last place I seen before I went to, uh, to prison at the age of 16. I was arrested right here in apartment B. December 28, 1989. Whew, boy. Just going back to that night, thinking about that night, it's, it's like, it's hard. It's like emotional because, man, I made, I made a drastic, I made a drastic decision that changed my life for forever. And it changed the lives of those that came in contact with me that night. It was a real sad night. It's, it's like a night that I didn't want to be Scrooge, but I, I played Scrooge because it was Christmas night, 1989, when the incident that changed my life and changed those people's lives after. Christmas night, the time to be jo uh, joyful and jolly. Sadly, I brought sadness to people's lives on that night. So I'm returning here because this is the last place I saw my freedom at. This is the place that, that I glamorized and I glorified through my life because this is like the heart and soul of our neighborhood. This is where <laughs> you gotta be tough to be in this, in these projects. And I think you gotta be tough to be in any projects in America. Like they say, your ghetto is no harder, no harder than mine. You know, over here, you gotta be tough. And so this is why I returned to this spot to shoot this scene because I was here. And it was a real tough time. It was a real rough time. And uh, you know, I survived it, but I survived it by making bad decisions because my survival made other people not survive. And that's not a real, real good existence. You know, to, uh, to have to live like that is, is real, real. <laughs> it's kind of like insane. You know, we speak about insanity doing the same thing over and over again. You know, out here at the time that I was living here, and I think now that insanity was based upon my survival and that survival was based upon a street life. 